As you know, or you, maybe you don't know, maybe you haven't been keeping up, we are looking uh, at Thanksgiving. Not necessarily Thanksgiving holiday, but Thanksgiving. Giving thanks. And we are looking at Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 17. And throughout this week, we've been moving toward what I call the Thanksgiving test. And today we have arrived at the test itself. And the test is not a quiz, it is a way of evaluating our behavior. It is a way of evaluating our words and our works, whatever we say, whatever we do. It is a way of, of applying a principle, and we'll get to that. Now, as we do in verse 17, you have to keep verses 12 through 16 in mind. Those are assumed. Well, what is that? Well, we've looked at those. First of all, it has to do with recognizing who we are, or perhaps more importantly, whose we are. We belong to God. We're part of his chosen people if we have that relationship with him through faith in Jesus Christ by his grace. So if that is true, then there are certain characteristics that need to be in our lives, and we need to make every effort to have these in our lives. And we looked at that, a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another, forgiving each other, whoever has a complaint against anyone. Just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. Now, those characteristics, those are family traits that should be there. Beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. Love is the overarching thing, that agape love that we talked about that wills to love the beloved. Not based on emotion, not based on what I can get. It's based on simply choosing to love. And that not only binds those characteristics together, love holds them together, but it binds the community together as well as those things are practiced within the community. Then there's this. We looked at this one yesterday. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you, live in you, abundantly, overflowing, be rich in the word of Christ. With all wisdom, while you are teaching, with all wisdom, and admire, while you're admonishing one another, and while you are singing psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness of hearts to God. The thing that governs our worship is uh, the word of Christ dwelling in us, which uh, corrects us. It corrects our worship. It informs us. It corrects us by showing what we need to know, by admonishing us in the way we live, correcting our path, adjusting that, adjusting our thoughts. Um, but it also corrects the songs that we sing. It is all got to conform to the word of Christ. It's got to conform to him, in other words, which leads us to this final one today. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. And that is an overarching principle. That is an overarching, um, I don't know that it's a, it's not necessarily a command. Well, it is sort of a, com a command in that sense that it's imperative, do it, do, well, not really. It is more of a principle that determines our behavior based upon all those things we just looked at. One, that we are part of God's chosen people by God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ, that we have the characteristics of the family, that the, the uh, peace of Christ is ruin, ruling in our lives. It's the umpire of our lives and determines that for us. The word of Christ, uh, we're rich in the word of Christ. It is dwelling in us abundantly. We, we know it and we've embraced it. Uh, it corrects our thoughts and our songs. It corrects our behavior and our songs. Then it comes down to this last thing. And it's like uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 31, where Paul says, uh, whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do for the glory of God. Do all for the glory of God. And so that's a comprehensive thing, too. We don't really get a Ten Commandments, so to speak. Uh, Paul said that the law was given until we were mature enough uh, not to have a teacher alongside of us, not to have a, a pedagogue uh, with us. That was someone who went along with 
the children of the family, to instruct them in right and wrong, to make sure they behaved. When you reach a level of maturity, you don't need the pedagogy anymore. Uh, you, you know what the Father's will is. And so when we come to this in the Christian life, there should be a maturity that we know what the will of the Father is. And we have these principles that guide us and direct us, and we know the Word of Christ that richly dwells in us, and we know that we belong to the people of God through faith in Christ, and there are characteristics that we put on, and, and that's the love that is characteristic primarily of our lives. So that we come to this, whatever you do, and that means anything, whatever you do, whether it's uh, eating a, uh, a, a good meal, or whether it's playing tennis, or golf, or going fishing, or uh, chopping down a tree, sawing a tree up, whatever, whatever it might be, whatever you do, uh, actually, that's present tense. It's whatever you are doing. Do all, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now, what does it mean to do something in the name of someone? Well, in that time, it meant that, yes, one, it means that we represent that person uh, who we are naming. I am doing this in the name of Caesar. I am doing this in the name of the Lord Jesus. That means we are representing them. This is what they would want done. And then the second part of that is we have the authority to act in the name of Jesus. So the first governing thing is this. If what we are doing, which is what he says in the present tense, if we're doing this, or if we're thinking about doing something, here is the first governing question. This is the test, part one. Can we do this as a representative of the Lord Jesus? Can we do this in the authority that he has given us to act in his name? Is this something that Jesus would do? Is this something Jesus would sanction? Is this something that we can do representing Jesus? In the name of Jesus, I am doing this. Wow. That's a tough one, isn't it? In the name of Jesus, I am cheating on my taxes. In the name of Jesus, I am committing voter fraud. In the name of Jesus, I am committing abortion. In the name of Jesus, I am committing drunkenness. In the name of Jesus, I am smoking these cigarettes. In the name of Jesus, can we do those things? In the name of Jesus, I'm ignoring my diabetes. You get my point? That is a tremendous test. In the name of Jesus, can I cuss this man out? In the name of Jesus, can I be angry at this man to the point of violence? In the name of Jesus, can I cheat off of my neighbor's paper while I'm taking a test? In the name of Jesus, can I steal? That's the question, isn't it? As the people of God, we have to ask that question. That's the per first part of the Thanksgiving test. Can I represent Jesus and do this thing? Can I represent Jesus and speak this way? He says, in, in word or in deed, in what we say or in the works that we do, can we do it in the name of Jesus? Because all that we do is to be done in his name. Now, that's a tough, woo. That gets right down to it, doesn't it? Well, preacher, that ain't none of your business. Well, you're right. It's not really my business unless you're a member of my congregation. Then it becomes my business. But it is God's business in how we behave. Does this bring a wrong impression of who Jesus is? If I'm acting in his name, and all of us do as believers, we carry the name of Christ. Does this bring glory to him? Or does this give the wrong impression of him? You know, it's like uh, somebody with a Jesus sticker on their car and they're cutting people off in traffic and cussing people out and giving people the finger and all that kind of stuff. Now, what kind of impression of Jesus does that give? 
Well, it doesn't give any impression of Jesus. It just talks about that guy right there. They didn't, well, yeah, but that guy's representing Jesus. He's got the sticker on the car. He says that anyway. Maybe you think about before you put that sticker on your car. Anyway, <laughs> I'm being facetious, of course, but you get my point. We have to stop and think, is this representing Jesus in a correct light or not? Now, of course, remember, the other things are assumed before you get to verse 17, that you actually are born again, that you, you are putting on the clothes, the characteristics of God's people, that we are governed by love and governed by the peace of Christ and the word of Christ is dwelling in us richly, abundantly. We're not ignorant of the word. So then when we come to this, and, and, and we are worshiping, we are people of worship before you ever get to this. Now you've got a means to understand if something correctly represents Jesus or not. If those other things are true in our lives, then we can do that. If we have shortcutted all of that, if we've just given it short shrift, we, we uh, well, maybe, I, maybe I'm a Christian. I don't know. I once was. I'm not sure. I walked down an aisle. I said a prayer. I had water thrown at me or dunked under it. and I don't know. I, you know. Maybe I was. Maybe I wasn't. I don't know. If that's your position, then there is no way you can know whether what you're about to do or are doing is giving a correct impression of who Jesus is, that you can do it not only in his name, but the authority has been given to you to do this thing. If there's no evidence of these characteristics in your life, then I've got a question whether you are a person of God. If love is not controlling you, if the, if the, if the peace of Christ isn't ruling your life, if the word of Christ doesn't richly dwell in you if you're completely ignorant of the Bible. And I'm not talking about somebody who just got saved. I'm talking about somebody who has been a Christian and is supposed to be mature in the faith. If those questions aren't answered, if you can't give affirmative to those, then you certainly aren't going to know whether you can do this in the name of the Lord Jesus or not. And then the second part of the test is this. Why? It's a preposition, and it is, it is either as giving thanks or while giving thanks. So as you're doing this, can you, in the midst of it, be giving thanks through Jesus to God for this thing that you're doing or that I'm doing or that I'm thinking about doing? If I, while I'm thinking about doing that or I'm in the process of doing it, can I give thanks through Jesus, since I'm doing it in his name, and I'm doing it by his authority, through him can I give thanks to God for this thing that I'm doing or I'm about to do? Well, that, that's the thanksgiving test. Can I give thanks? Can I give glory to God? Can I give God thankful praise for this that I'm doing? That's a tough one, isn't it? That's the test. Can we be thankful? Can we do it in the name of Jesus? Can we do it by his authority? While we're doing it, can we give grateful praise to God for this thing we're doing? If we apply that principle in our lives, I think it would correct a lot of the things. If we would stop long enough to let that test be taken, I think we would go far. How does that apply today? How does that apply? Well, I think before we make accusations, before we're angry at someone, before, especially during this election time when there's so much up in the air and there's so much questions, so many accusations, so much anger, so much frustration, all of that, then we need to keep all of this, verse 12 through verse 17 in line. And before we speak and before we write and before we act, Am I representing the Lord Jesus? Can I do this? Can I give thanks for this behavior? Thank you, God. Can you be angry and be a Christian? Yes. If you have reason, if it's righteous indignation, if it is something that is corrupt and immoral and it is destructive of God's creation, that includes human beings then yes, we should be angry and we should take action. But we do so governed by the word of Christ, the peace of Christ, and the love of Christ. Being gentle, being kind, being compassionate. 
keeping all of that in mind, yes, but not vindictive, not ugly, not hateful, because what we do, we must do as representatives of Jesus Christ on his authority and giving thanks through him to God for it. Listen, I hope, my prayer is, that we'll all take the Thanksgiving test before we act and before we speak. I know if in my past there have been many times I have spoken before I took that test, and I, in every case, wish I had taken the test first. I pray that that's true for you as for me, that we will take that test, that we will know the word of Christ, that it will richly dwell in us, and that we will know that God is sovereign and that he rules over his creation. And really, you can trust him in the midst of all of this. Is there wickedness going on? Sure. It was going on before the election. It'll go on after the election until his kingdom comes and his will is done on earth as it is in heaven. We are to be those representatives of Jesus Christ in this world and live out our heavenly citizenship here, showing people we can't act like everybody else. We're different. We don't speak like everybody else. We're different. We don't sing the same songs. We don't uh, worship the same as people who aren't believers. We don't do that. We are constrained and we are controlled by the peace of Christ, the word of Christ, and the knowledge that we are part of his chosen people by God's grace through faith. And we need to walk in that, especially in these days in which we live, when so much is at stake. We have to be the people of God. We can't hide in the corners and in the shadows anymore. We must be those people of God. I pray that I am, and I pray that you are too as a believer. Hey, listen, as I close this thing out, I want to end on a great note, and that great note is all of this stuff is marvelous. God loves us. He has called us, and he's calling out a people to himself, Jew and Gentile, into one people called the body of Christ, his people, his chosen people. I pray that you're a part of that. And if you are, then you know what I am saying is true, that God loves you, so much he gave his son that you might have forgiveness of sin, eternal life, and joy <laughs> indescribable right here and right now. It is yours. Won't you claim it? Won't you walk in it? Don't let fear, anger, frustration, don't let that rob you of the knowledge of who you are, whose you are. You're a child of the king, and you have joy indescribable that nothing and no one can take from you unless you let them. I pray that you walk in that today. Hey, listen, we're going to be worshiping uh, Sunday, this Sunday, 930 is our worship, 1045, our small group time in Sunday school. We are going to be open. I don't know how long we'll stay open, <laughs> but we're, we will be open. Uh, everything starts back up this Sunday and Wednesday night and all of that. All of that starts back up this Sunday. I'm looking forward to being with you. Uh, and if you don't have a church home, I invite you to come to Troy First Baptist. Be my guest. I'd love to meet you. love to talk with you. Um, and we're going to kick that off this Sunday. So I'm excited about that. And I will see you, if I don't see you Sunday, I will see you Monday as we turn toward Thanksgiving proper. Uh, the fruit of Thanksgiving and how that leads us into the Advent season which is only a couple of weeks away. Can you believe it? Anyway, my prayer is that God's blessings rest on you always. I'll see you Monday if I don't see you Sunday. God bless you.